afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a HPKU seminar today, and uh, today we will hear about the Qatari experience with the COVID diagnostics uh, from a clinical virologist who has been there from the start in the middle of this whole pandemic. Our speaker is Dr. Peter Coyle. Um, just before I get into his introduction, I just um, want to give you a housekeeping note that if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A um, section uh, to me and the panelists, and we will uh, go through the questions at the end of the seminars, and I'll read them out for Dr. Peter um, so we get answers. And another thing, please, everyone, mute your speakers if you have any speaker open uh, for the clarity of the presentation. Dr. Cole joined HMC in March 2017 as a senior consultant and head of virology uh, within the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology. He qualified in medicine and trained in microbiology and virology in Belfast and the cancer and the center of disease control Atlanta and completed doctoral thesis at Queen's University Belfast. He's a fellow of the College of Pathologists London and is a past president of the European Society of Clinical Virology. He holds an, an honorary professorship of uh, microbiology post in the Wellcome Wolfson Institute of Experimental Medicine at Queen's University Belfast and he's an adjunct professor in the Biomedical Research Center at Qatar University. His main interest main is interest. in the diagnosis and management of respiratory virus infections, and he has closely worked with the SWIC and NHSCG committees in developing responses to the current COVID pandemic. Uh, without further ado, I'll let the stage for Dr. Peter Cole to tell us about his experience in this COVID pandemic uh, that hit Qatar. Thank you, Dr. Peter, for joining. Okay, well, uh... Uh, good morning, or uh, it's good morning here. It's good afternoon, presumably where you are. Uh, we're going to look at SARS uh, COVID diagnostic stewardship. Um, I've deliberately used the term diagnostic stewardship because I think diagnostics uh, have played a key role in the uh, understanding of the COVID outbreak. And um, we have made some changes to make it more uh, user friendly. Uh, sorry for that. Um, so when the outbreak, um, when we started looking in March, uh, we had a staging of infection, basically categorical. The patients were either not infectious, not infected, or they were infected. And when we detected an infectious patient, uh, we used to identify contacts. Uh, contacts would be put to isolation or quarantine. And would be tested uh, to see whether they had picked up infection. Uh, we would have a cascade and rollout to try and pick up additional contacts where we thought this was necessary. Uh, if patients developed symptoms, then they were treated with a number of treatment modalities. And this was uh, progressed until the patient went negative. And this was ideally two negatives 24 hours apart. Uh, our current staging is slightly more elaborate. And I'll take you through this here. We either have a non-infected patient, and an, a patient in the early stages of infection, uh, a patient who's presenting uh, with acute infection, uh, a patient who is responding, recovering from infection, and then the patient who has completely recovered. So we tend to identify these five stages. Five. The first three stages take a seven-day period. Uh, th this is a highly infectious that replicates very quickly, gets to very high levels, and uh, then presents, although there are a lot of asymptomatic patients. So the patients are primarily infectious in the first seven days. Uh, after that, recover, hopefully. And this period usually four weeks before the patients uh, develop an antibody response. And most patients, will develop an antibody response following infection. As I said, it's a highly infected, there are now over 20 million cases, 750,000 deaths. This has spread globally from its emergence in December 2019 and has basically gone worldwide. In the early stages, the clinical prep 
It's fever, cough, shortness of breath, and pneumonia. Um, some patients are the progressive respiratory failure due to alveolar damage. A continuing fever was a poor hallmark with four lymphocyte counts and increased white cell counts. Um, patients had pulmonary infiltrates, did not respond to antibiotics. And in the initial stages in China, there was a history of contact with the seafood market. Patients presented with uh, severe pneumonia that progressed to ARDS and had a high mortality rate. We now know a little bit more about the infection. Actually, most patients have asymptomatic infection, but can prevent, present with fever and cough in the first week. Uh, this will usually clear, but for those patients, does not clear, the patients can develop respiratory symptoms. In the third week of the infection, um, patients can develop a coagulopathy and throw off blood clots that can cause pulmonary emboli and various other manifestations. In the fourth week, patients can develop uh, a sepsis illness, can develop multi-organ failure, and can uh, succumb to the infection. So we know a lot more about the uh, chronology of the infection than we did at the beginning, and this allows more interventions to be uh, adopted. The virus is pre present at presentation, and one of the issues is it can continue shedding for a long period beyond the stage where the patient is infectious. Most cases were thought to be asymptomatic or mild, um, with severe cases in about 14% and critical cases in maybe 6%. We think now that this is probably an overestimation and that there are a lot more mild and asymptomatic uh, infections than we first thought. There is an age in uh, and also patients with comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, um, are likely to have a severe illness uh, with poor outcomes. So WHO recommended that we should be using RT-PCR, and this is still the case. Um, we developed a local developed uh, RT-PCR test based on the Berlin primers, and we did our first test on the 26th of January, and we validated this with our colleagues in the Erasmus uh, uh, Laboratory in Rotterdam. We've since moved to commercial platforms that are either on a fully automated basis or on a manual basis. Serology and rapid antigen tests were not uh, advised, but were suggested that evaluation should take place, and we have undertaken some evaluations for both serology and rapid antigen tests. A country should tailor the response to the local text and phase. Now, this, this model of infection is probably the one that best fits what we have seen on the ground, where there's a short latent period post exposure to the infection, and this is followed by a short infectious period that lasts for about three and a half to four days. Patients may be asymptomatic for the first part of that infectious period, and then symptomatic for the second uh, part. But it's worth saying that actually most of these, uh, a lot of these cases are asymptomatic. After the infectious stage, uh, the patients hopefully will recover, uh, but viral shedding can continue for a long period of weeks and months. And this has caused a lot of confusion as to when patients cease to be infectious. The serial interval is quite short. It's within seven days. Some, some reports put it as short as three to five days. Uh, patients transmit for one to two days before becoming symptomatic if they do become symptomatic, but you get a long tail of RNA detection. And initially, um, there was a priority put on two negative samples spaced 24 hours apart, but the long tail that we detect of RNA makes this very difficult and problematic. So characteristically, this is what we see when patients come into hospital. Let me explain that day one, day two is not the first day on the second day. Day one is the day that we've taken the first sample from the patient, and then day two is the second day. So that normally is about seven to 14 days later. But so this is the classical case. This is, a, this is um, a summary of 250 patients that I put together. On day one, when the patient presents, there's a relatively low CT value. The median is 25, but over the next week or so, the CT rises. In other words, the viral load falls, and the patient probably enters into a non-infectious stage. The most highly 
infectious stage is at CTs below 20. I tend to see uh, samples below 20 and probably about 40% of the patients that we see on day one. And you're more likely to see these in clinical infections rather than patients who are being sampled for surveillance purposes. The samples that we take to diagnose infection, it was originally and is mostly still a combined nasopharyngeal swab and oropharyngeal swab put into the same vial of transport medium. However, CDC has updated their, their recommendations and suggests that as well as that, we can also go for a single nasopharyngeal swab or a mid-turbinate swab or even an anterior nares swab or an oropharyngeal swab. And there are publications suggesting that either healthcare worker assisted or self-collected are sufficient for uh, acquiring a reasonable sample. And it's worth saying that when you're trying to diagnose this in, a, in an acute patient, there is a very high viral load. So getting an appropriate sample is not that difficult. Um, just to explain our molecular assay, you know, we amplify the target or the gene or target genes over 40 cycles of amplification. And in RT-PCR, we define a cycle threshold is the cycle of amplification where the, where the signal becomes positive. So in other words, if the signal becomes positive at cycle 13, we refer to this as cycle as CT or cycle threshold 13. If there is a lot of virus, the cycle thresholds will be lower. And for less virus, the cycle thresholds will be higher. And normally you get this nice sigmoid curve in keeping with an acute, uh, an acute positive detection. However, you also get quite weak values and weak curves at higher CT values. And for these, it's more problematic. These could represent recovering from an infection, or this could represent somebody just an acute infection, or it also could be a false positive. There's been a cross-contamination uh, during the processing of the sample. And uh, so these weak positives can be difficult unless you're following a patient through and you multiple samples from the same patient. Additionally, commercial companies who develop these assays will also refer at this point to results that they refer to as inconclusive. And usually this means that they have a signal, but it doesn't quite match the signal that they would regard as being in keeping with a positive result. We have also introduced, as I mentioned, another clarification where we call samples with a CT above 30, we no longer call these positive, we call them reactive, because we're trying to differentiate these um, for, for clinical interpretation purposes. So this is the, um, the changes that we have made to our reporting algorithm have gone from a positive, negative, and conclusive triad to one that includes a reactive uh, result as well, and I'll discuss how and why we've come to this conclusion. So, if we see again, we would see, um, we would result, we would report, okay, as well as saying positive, negative, or whatever, we all report the CT value, and we, for, we report four categories of positive, negative, inconclusive, and reactive. And uh, this allows us to be more um, specific in dealing with the, the result getting, and also this hopefully should allow a better interpretation at the clinical level. Um, as we can see, uh, when we look at, at samples collected during service, the patients who are symptomatic tend to have lower CT value than patients who are asymptomatic. And again, if you look at patients who have got a CT value below CT25, Five symptomatic patients are five times more likely to have a CT below 25 than patients who are asymptomatic. The question we were asking ourselves is can we use additional measures to categorize whether the patient is infectious or not? And I would say that every single unit needs to do this based on their own data. This is not something that's cross applicable to another unit without independent validation. If we look at the um, CDC, they published um, in June some data that would suggest that virus 
of a CT above CT 33 is rarely possible to isolate virus from this type of sample, which would suggest that maybe that type of sample is coming from a patient who's infectious. They were also able to show that by and large, do not isolate virus beyond eight days. So two measures here that we might be able to use, CT value, a measure of viral load, and the days post presentation, either from a PCR positive or for symptomatic presentation. And likewise, from Bern Tay Hospital has, has shown that they were not able to virus beyond day eight, and not able to isolate virus from lower, lower viral loads, and come up with a, a recommendation that patients be considered for discharge after 10 days after the presentation, or less than 10 to the five copies uh, per mil in sputum. A study from Canada was showing that they isolate virus uh, above CT24 or above eight days. So you can see even from these studies that the, there seems to be a cutoff around day eight, nine, where it's by and large difficult or impossible to isolate virus. And the CT values are more variable as to when you can suggest a patient may or may not be um, asymptomatic, or sorry, non infectious uh, The French group from Marseille um, showed that above CT33, they were no longer able to isolate the virus, and again, suggested patients may no longer be infectious at this stage. Uh, a study from Rotterdam has shown patients could have, in this study, they were able to isolate the virus up to day 20, but having said that, these, this was a cohort of severely critically ill patients who are known to shed virus for a longer period of time. Um, but as the uh, period of time went on, and as the viral load came down, the likelihood of isolation uh, decreased, and therefore the infectivity of the patient uh, went down. Another interesting thing that they pointed out in the study is that serum neutralizing antibodies of greater than one, greater or equal to one in 20, was independently associated with non infectious SARS CoV 2, which suggests that neutralizing antibody, if present, may well block the forward transmission of, uh, of virus from one patient to another. A, a slightly different take on Korea CDC, where they followed patients who were discharged uh, following recovery to see whether they posed a risk to their contacts. And this is a common worry that we have. If we discharge patients too early, will they potentially infect more vulnerable patients at home? And their results were relative well, look, very reassuring in that the, the vast majority have no evidence of transmission, and if the three who had had additional reasons for becoming positive, and CT values above 30 were no longer culturable. And so, they, the, on the basis of this evidence, that the no additional tests were required for patients discharged. So, we have an intimation that CT values can be helpful, period from presentation can be helpful in this study from Korea, which suggests that patients discharge following recovery do not constitute a severe risk of transmission. Now, we've done a lot of testing in Qatar over the last uh, six months. We've probably tested as much as any country in the world. Uh, we've confirmed as a lot of infections. Uh, we've, so we've got a lot of experience of this year, and I think we were trying to use this to see if we could better manage our patients and better have better patient flows. So from about 67,000 patients, I carried out about 500,000 tests and confirmed about 100,000 patients. You can see that the tests behave very reproducibly. They've got good agreements, good correlations, and good Kappa scores. So we think that in our hands, the CT values coming from these assays could be useful for prediction and infection. This summary, again, shows you what I showed you earlier on, patients presenting early have got low CT values, which, which predictably progress and rise in keeping with a falling viral load. And then you get to the stage where you have got a long period, like a small plateau where the virus is detectable for quite a long period of time. <clears throat> and it's probably in this stage that a lot of the question marks have arisen 
about infections and reinfections. There's a lot of publications in the literature suggesting that reinfections are a significant clinical and transmissible occurrence and something that we need to be aware of. And this is something we're very keen and have done some work on locally to see whether this holds up uh, within our figures. So this is a summary of 67,000 patients where we can see that the virus behaves quite predictably from presentation through to viral appearance. And if we look at the, uh, again, it's slightly more find that patients presenting predictably for maybe one to two days in before they progress to a CT value. And this is quite a linear progression in the early stages of the infection. However, once you get to around CT 25, 26, 27, it becomes less linear, it becomes less predictable, and you almost get a, a patient stalling in these groups. They're, they're not progressing in keeping with what looks like a normal response to a normal viral infection. So on the basis of this, it looks like in the early stages, we see an active viral infection behaving in a normal linear manner and progressing predictably. But once you go beyond the five, the virus behaves unpredictably. And we think this is because we're not looking at replicating virus, we're looking at viruses being shed from cells that have been damaged by the virus. And if you look at the proportion of patients in any of these categories, actually the bulk of the patients that we come across are probably in the later stages and the higher CT value, and then maybe 50 to 60% of patients are, in, are detected at a time point where they've gone past the linear replicative cycle of the virus and are now in a stage where they're probably, what we're representing is non-infectious virus. So, if we tried to pick a C pick the uh, CDC uh, CT value of 30, we could place that and we would essentially include about 8% of patients that we would then calling non-infectious, which really isn't much of a help in trying to better manage patients. And we think based on our figures, is probably too conservative. If we know the best fits the infections that present and uh, see locally, which is the short latent period followed by a short period of maybe four days of highly infectious transmission, then this would put us at a CT value of 22. And therefore, if we use this as a cutoff, that would mean patients presenting below CT, CT22 be regarded as infectious, whereas those above that would be regarded as non-infectious. If we take another, which is based on the incubation period of about five months, and I know in the literature, incubation periods can go up to about 12, 14 days. This has really not been our experience. Um, so if we're taking a, an incubation period of about five days, and if we couple that with the period where we show that an infectious virus can be isolated from patients, which is eight, nine days, if we combine the five days with the nine days, that is up to about a CT28. And if we take the cutoff, we would have infectious virus, or patients were regarded as infectious below CT28, but above that period, uh, would be above that CT value cutoff would be all non-infectious. So, at a point of view, we have taken a CT value of greater than 30 as our cutoff, which best fits our model, which builds in a degree of safety and conservative interpretation, and fits our data. I, I have to emphasize that this is not, a, not a CT value that somebody else could take and apply without reviewing the context that they're applying it in. You need to look at your own data, your own patient set, and your own management arrangements, and build your interpretations around those. And that's essentially what we have done. And as I say, as a pragmatic, rather than as a scientific absolute cutoff, we've taken 30 as our delineating cutoff. What this allows us to do is to read the, the patients that we report on, so below CT or equal to CT30, we call a patient positive. Above 30, we call them reactive. Um, we still have conclusive results. And if, the, uh, if there's a negative, we report them as negative. Now, this has allowed us to uh, put 
detailed interpretative comments for every single result that we release. So we just don't release the result category. We release this category, we release the CT value, and we release detailed interpretative comments for each of those categories. And that, that's really very important to underline that. To just give you an example, this is a negative patient. Now remember, as a clinician, you are seeing the patient. So if this patient who's just been exposed two days ago to a case of COVID, a negative result really doesn't mean anything. Um, in other words, you have to interpret all the results that you get with the patient that you're seeing and that you're managing. So a patient who's negative could be somebody getting tested in the early stages before the, before the virus is detectable, or it could be somebody who's negative, who has recovered from an infection. Anyway, so this is one category. We have a patient, if the patient is in a low and a high CT value, this is a patient who could have recently been infected and therefore is in pr the progress of uh, de developing a high viral load and becoming transmissible. So when we see patients in this category who are in an outbreak situation, they're being investigated as part of an outbreak or who are being investigated following a contact, we always ask for a follow-up sample uh, to categorize whether the patient is becoming highly infectious. Um, if we see a patient in the positive category below 30, then we're saying that this patient is infectious and this patient uh, should be managed as an acute case of COVID. Uh, if we see a patient who's following on from an acute phase, who's now clearing the virus, we say now that this page, patient has got to the point where they're greater than CT30 and could be considered non-infectious for management purposes. And then again, we hope to see that the patient recovers and goes negative. So how has this helped us? It has helped us to make more of periods of infectiousness. It has allowed discharge from quarantine. It has facilitated movement of pain between COVID and non-COVID hospitals. It has freed up hospital quarantine resources. It has rationalized periods of self-isolation and it provides more appropriate inclusion criteria if you're undergoing to if you're going to undergo a study, particularly with an intervention, I think it would be critical that you do have good criteria for enrollment of patients. So that takes us to the antibody responses and what they and what they can tell us. Now, we know that patients who get a COVID infection develop antibodies probably by week or three and almost everyone by week four. And at this point, just to say that what is the likelihood of reinfections taking place? Now, for me, I've been working on this as being a definition of a reinfection. Patient comes into hospital with a low CT value, goes through a period of recovery and is discharged, and then is readmitted with a similar clinical episode with a low CT value and goes through a similar period of recovery. Now, currently, I can't find any local evidence that fits this pattern. I know it's quite uh, a stern criteria, but I think it's critical that we are definitive about being able to confirm reinfections as real events and real clinical events with transmission potential. It's also worth saying that remember, most of the cases that occur in a primary pandemic are primary infections. And primary infections by their nature are weak, slow, and rise gradually and take maybe two to three, as we see on maybe four weeks to, to, to uh, peak. For secondary infections, secondary antibody responses, either if you were being vaccinated or if you were being infected for the second time, these antibody concentrations rise quickly, the response is more intense and the antibodies last longer. So we would expect for most of the primary infections that we, were, we will see, is a low antibody response that will wane depending on how, how high the antibody level was in the first place. And this is critical because people keep saying these antibodies are waning. This shows that the patients are becoming infect, are susceptible. This is exactly what you would expect. And you would expect that when they get reinfected, that they would get a secondary response that would be protective for both them and for both and their contacts. So we measure antibodies using the standard ELISAs. There are three main assays out there at the minute. 
a nuclear protein assay, which is what we're using as our main laboratory based assay. Uh, antibodies based against the spike protein and the receptor binder proteins. The nuclear protein is an internal protein, the spike and receptor binder proteins are external, and there's thought that you get a higher and more sustained antibody response to the latter two. Um, so we measure antibodies, and I think it'll be coming uh, important if we want to use these as a measure of protection, that we are specific, and that when we detect antibody, that we say this is definitively SARS-CoV-2 antibody. And it might be that we need to do an additional test, for example, an additional ELISA, or a blot assay, or a neutralization assay, or use some sort of quantitative response to define the specificity of the result. We have done a little bit of um, OD, but we respond, we report um, our results in optical density units. And we can see in this small study of 120 odd cases that we get good agreement between two assays, one measuring the nuclear protein, one measuring, you know, these are actually two nuclear protein assays, that it's a good agreement up to about a C, an optical density of five and below that we start to get disagreement. So we're trying to use this as where we can definitively put a threshold where we, where we can be happy that we Specificity is there, and it, it, do we expect SARS will run, run through this um, of primary and secondary responses? Well, the evidence looks quite good. There's a rhesus macaque study uh, from China looked at the response in primary challenge and rechallenge, and if you can see the highlight circle of neutralizing antibodies, you can see 14 days after the primary check in a relatively low level of antibody was detected. Was 14 days after the re-challenge, there was a, a rapid response, and this was reflected both in cellular and humoral responses. So this is very reassuring that in the animal model, responses to SARS-CoV-2 look as if they're behaving as we would like them to, uh, to behave. Also, if you look at the uh, action in the same model, in the primary challenge, we'll viral distribution throughout the animal and the the upper respiratory tract, which is highlighted there in the red circle. The animal is re-challenged. We see that the uh, immune system controls the virus. And so putting these two things together, we get a cellular and humoral response and re-challenge, and we get the virus being controlled. So this is very reassuring that we would expect in a re-exposure and reinfection, the patient would not get clinically unwell and would not reach a level of viral virus load that is transmissible. Uh, results from Mount Sinai in New York from the, there, which has produced some really excellent uh, results uh, over the last few months, show that the vast majority of people respond and produce neutralizing antibodies, and that the majority of people will have neutralizing antibodies above uh, 1 in 10. Now, if you, if you think back to the Rotterdam study, where a 1 in 20 was regarded as independently protective, then this is a reassuring that this is exactly what we want to see in patients. So their assumption is that reinfection is possible, but it's not likely. And I would under underline that's clinical infection is not likely. Clinical reinfection. The responses in our cohorts look very similar. Patients who, we, who had an acute infection in, in May, the end of May, and developed a seroconversion and a nice uh, response climbing into what we would hopefully regard as protective. And it's worth saying that the higher the antibody levels, the higher correlation with neutralizing antibodies is seen. We've, seen with the, we've done a seroprevalence study through an IRB project. And uh, this has been very uh, informative. This is the first analysis we've done of, of you know, three four weeks ago. The overall seropositivity was uh, 26%. Um, we were seeing a very similar picture that we saw in patients who were detected by PCR, and that we see mostly the outbreaks that the outbreak that we've seen in Qatar has been mostly in manual and craft workers, which are mostly young male workers, and the seropositivity in the age band reflects that. Also, the seropositivity by nationality reflects that as well. It's very similar to the results that we get by PCR. The local Qatari population and expats, however, have not really been overly exposed in this situation and have got relatively low seroprevalence levels. 
The age range again is reflective of the um, of this outbreak, and that we see a, a wider age range in the category group, um, which involves children and more elderly patients, whereas the uh, the manual craft workers tend to have a a lower median and a narrower age range is uh, detected. They're very in, um, informative as well and very encouraging. The, the, further, the further we get from a confirmed case, confirmed by PCR, the higher the antibody levels. So when we get out to maybe you know, 40, 50 days, we've got nearly over a 90, 95% zero positivity. And actually, this is a higher level than you would expect if you were measuring somebody following a primary infection. And what it suggests is that probably a lot of these patients are being re-exposed to the virus and maybe being reinfected subclinically and having a boost to their antibodies. The other reassuring thing for these high antibody levels is we're using a nuclear protein assay, which theoretically gives you lower levels and levels that will wane more quickly. And this study from uh, London, from Julie Brewer's group, shows you that the nuclear protein assays, antibodies in green, have a, a lower um, half-life and wane more quickly than those uh, measuring the spike of receptive binder proteins. So again, this is very reassuring because we're using the assay for a nuclear protein one and we're getting very good antibody results. So we have seen a lot of infection and confirmed a lot of infection here. It's over 100, 110,000 now. Uh, if we extrapolate the seroprevalence study, uh, it probably suggests that we've infected maybe over 700,000, and maybe we've infected a large proportion of the population um, that are currently res resident in, in Qatar. And, this, and we've looked at a group of these to see, do we have any evidence to suggest that we're getting reinfections as I previously defined? Well, so looking at patients, um, defining reinfection as somebody who's presenting and representing the CT below 21 with a three week gap. Um, are we seeing any patients who fit into this category? And the answer is I, in this, res, this review of over 60,000 patients, I could only find 10 who fit into that category. And these patients were either severe prolonged infections in, in patients who were having a severe illness, or they were patients who were immunocompromised, or in one case, it was a laboratory error. So from our, from my perspective, I can't really see much evidence that reinfection are a significant occurrence, apart from probably asymptomatic re-exposure, which are actually an official thing to boost the immune system. So should we be looking at immune responses more, uh, to use them more in this outbreak? Now, if we look at this small group that we were following through, um, we had two confirmed patients in a cohort um, who were confirmed. And when we followed those patients up uh, two weeks later, uh, we saw the two patients had zero converted, whereas the, uh, the other patients remained non-infectious. Now, we can measure antibodies by, looking, by using a laboratory-based uh, protocol, a laboratory-based ELISA, or you can measure antibodies using capillary blood, uh, taking a sample from a finger prick, and doing it on one of these rapid lateral flow devices. These are very simple and easy to use. A blood is put onto a little well, and then a buffer is added, and this migrates with a lateral flow up past the specific antigens, and it gives you an antibody response. And you can see here, you get a control line, and you get an IgG or an IgM. In this case, we have a positive IgG line. These tests have got high specificity, but they're lower sensitivity than the laboratory based assay. So to, to use this, we need to have a, a lancet that allows you to take a sample. You may need a pastette to collect the blood, or you can deliver the blood spot directly to the, the, uh, the lateral flow device. The most difficult thing about this assay is getting the sample into it, but with a little bit of practice and training, this is very easy to do. So in relation to reinfections, does recovery indicate immunity? I think it does. Qatar has, in my experience, and for other people working on this, and I'm open to uh, persuasion, have shown that um, there's no evidence of reinfection as I've defined it. The group in New York said reinfection is possible, but not likely. 
In a number of teleconferences I've been going on, the delegates have suggested in their countries they do not see reinfection. The data from South Korea would similarly re-emphasize re that. And animal studies show that you can reinfect, but it's a protective reinfection that is not associated with clinical infection and transmission. So our antibody levels are very reassuring. And we're hopefully suggesting that we should look at pilots that look at should we accept the concept of post-infection immunity? And if so, could we could use that concept to recognize the this condition formally? So in other words, somebody would have a formal record, password, whatever you call it, of having recovered from an infection. We would like to look at the potential benefits of this. Uh, in the different sectors, and I believe there are many, many benefits to be had from this. But we also want to look at the potential for failure. So, in other words, if we accept this, we have to accept that potentially we're wrong, and if we're wrong, we need to, to act on that. So, I think with this in mind, we have discussed the potential for where this could impact. Certainly, within Hamid Medical Corporation, there are a lot of areas where we could see patient flow could be improved, both in emergency departments, day procedure units, pre-surgical screening, uh, in staff surveillance. Um, also, there are key sectors, key industrial sectors, where again, this could be beneficial. Also, Hamad Medical, Hamad International Airport. So, there are a number of areas that are worth looking at to see if we could run uh, some pilots that could give us the uh, information that we need to use this, uh, to use this effectively. So we currently have the formal way of identifying patient status as the ETHRAS, where we have red for infected, yellow for quarantine, gray for contact, and green for uh, potentially uh, susceptible. And uh, the question is, is there any way that we could identify a formal recognition of recovery as something that we could utilize uh, to impact patient? So with that, I would like like uh, my colleagues in HMC, Dr. Naima, Dr. Ms. Riham, and Ms. Jaham from Point of Care Test that we work with, um, members of SWIC and uh, the Strategic Command and DLMP, uh, Professor Leith from uh, Royal Cornell, Dr. Andrew from Occupational Health and his team, and Dr. Olaf from Aspatar. And I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Peter. That was a really insightful presentation. Um, so uh, I'll start with taking questions uh, from the uh, Q and A, and um, I also have some questions of mine as well. So uh, one of the questions is there a link between the CT value and the severity? Um, of that's a good question. <laughs> um, I I don't think so. No, there isn't really. You know, because uh, classically, when the patient presents they present with a mild illness in the first week and that's when the CT are at their highest and uh, it's when the patient wrong clinical problems the CT values have started to fall and so normally if somebody's got say an acute pneumonia the upper respiratory tract levels will be relatively low but lower respiratory tract levels will have high levels and in those situations they're probably is a correlation uh, with high C sorry low CT value high viral loads in patients who are having severe illness, and I have seen and that that study from Rotterdam uh, would be one example of that. But there isn't really a direct link with the upper respiratory tract, and this is the same for almost any other respiratory virus, whether it's MERS, whether it's flu, you get the same thing. The upper airways clears, and the virus concentrates in the lower airways. That does make sense, um, actually. Uh, the next question is, uh, so when handling blood and uh, for the serology testing, is there a chance or um, you know, a risk of being infected? Uh, for, like, you know, is there an active virus in the blood? That's really the question. Um, I think the, the likelihood of infected from blood is, I mean, there is, you can detect low level virus, but um, it's, not, yeah. it's not really regarded as, uh, Infectious. I'm not sure that we can isolate virus from that, and that there are no yeah. additional steps uh, associated with that. Yeah, I've actually seen some literature that actually excludes any active virus from the blood or serum. Uh, 
So, um, so there's another question. Uh, so the antibody testing, uh, do, how, how do you know it's specific for SARS-CoV-2 and not other coronaviruses? And uh, is that an important thing to know? I think from an academic, something that's worth doing, and I think to do that, you would have to do immunization studies against the other seasonal coronaviruses. Um, but yeah. I think to date, the, uh, the virus or the antibody test that's probably been the most specific is new antibodies, and that has been that has been associated with high specificity. So it is something that needs to be borne in mind. But I think at this stage, um, we're quite happy that the viruses, the antibodies we're detecting are specific. But there's another question that's raised. One of the questions is that we think that the lack of infectivity in young children could in some way be associated with their exposure to seasonal coronaviruses and some cross-protective antibodies and cellular responses that are more likely to be seen in children than adults because they get more viral infections than adults okay. and probably there is a degree of cross protection but i think the antibodies that we're level that we're measuring in our, in our hands have behaved extremely uh, specifically and almost mirror exactly what we're seeing by pcr okay uh, so there's a question about the, the uh, cutoff of having reactive CT value of under 30 and then over 30. And I think uh, the question is, and I have more to add to that question, so I'm just going to read it carefully. It says that, uh, you know, um, do, do the patients uh, with CT under 30 have, well, subsequently, did they get the CT value lower in subsequent specimens? I'm guessing that's really what happens clinically anyway. I mean, you wait for the CT value to, to go higher before you release them. Well, as patients uh, who uh, develop complications, patients who develop severe illnesses are managed irrespective of this value. Uh, the, the majority of patients who come in and recover, the CT values are very predictable. They're, they're low to start with it, rise, the patient recovers and is discharged. Um, it's not really very useful for a patient who's clinically unwell, who's being managed. And um, CT values are not really going to help at that stage. But they, they do continue to, to rise. And even severely ill patients quite often will have a low CT value. The, the problem is uh, quite often they may have developed, uh, if they've developed a lower respiratory infection, they may have a low CT value infection going on in the lower respiratory tract. Okay, so I'm adding a question to this particular question. So with the CT value uh, above 30 labeled as uh, you know, reactive, but safe in terms of quarantine, which shortens the quarantine time. And clearly that would have an economical impact and lifestyle impact, of course. So I understand the rationale behind it. But from, uh, have you had any observations that go against that model where you had someone who's released with a CT value above 30 and they infected a contact, someone at, in that home or someone they've been in contact with? Uh, not personally. Um, the study from Korea designed to look at that. And uh, that was very reassuring from our point of view, because at that stage, again, infection and reinfection was, uh, was, was more widely accepted. And they were doing a follow-up to address that question. Where was it a risk to be at home? And their outcome was it wasn't. Um, from our point of view, from my point of view, um, I haven't seen CT values in with reinfection. But I know there are another couple of groups working this and are looking at a, a smaller number of maybe 10, 10 patients. I would be really, really keen uh, to see those. And actually, uh, on that point, uh, look at mentioning South Korea. So there's a question about the local cultures and how, uh, you know, maybe different cultures, the city values and the way they interact and they behave, you know, in terms of contact tracing, in terms of uh, contacting each other. So someone who could have a, you know, sort of a intermediate city value could infect more people because they communicating with more people. I think that's the question. Um, you know, uh, I mean, the um, I'm not quite sure I, I catch that patients in the early stages, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, will be um, capable of transmitting to contacts. And um, I think the likelihood of so the vast majority of cases where transmissions take place or the model that we follow is a, a relatively short, highly infectious period. Now, there is a fear of risk of almost any CT value patient being able to transmit, but this is not supported by the evidence. 
and that would be more anecdotal than real. And our evidence looking at our patients was a very, very high uh, patient number, which is suggests it's quite predictable how the virus goes through this short period of infectivity and then relatively rapidly declines where it's no longer infectious. Okay. Um, so there's another question. Sorry, that question was not clear. Even the reading of it, I didn't really get the exact question. So. Uh, there's a question also. I have someone said, I have heard of some concavalent plasma exacerbates clinical symptom, exacerbates clinical symptom, symptoms. Are they cases of damaging host immunity? So, plasma transfers to. I think first have been used and are being used, have been used locally and elsewhere. Um, I haven't heard of them exhausting anything. I think what they have been shown is to have a moderate benefit. Um, where they have been used in patients who have had a COVID infection. So I don't think they're going to be a, a game change. But in the early stages, and particularly we had nothing else, um, I think there was a moderate benefit. The real, I mean, Qatar has had a very low mortality rate. And I should emphasize that one of the things here is that we have done a lot of testing. We've tested over 500,000 samples. And one of the advantages of doing that, we were able to identify patients in the early stages. In other words, we would have picked up most symptomatic patients that we, we didn't get, obviously the asymptomatic patients we would have missed, but we were picking up symptomatic patients. Symptomatic patients were put into isolation. We developed a whole laboratory, our whole hospital infrastructure around those and an ambulance service that was able to get patients who needed into hospital to get them in rapidly, to get them on the oxygen rapidly. So I think the fact that we tested so many, identified so many, put them in a position where they were rapidly accessing good healthcare facilities has played a major role in keeping the mortality rate low here. And I think countries that have tested less and haven't had the backup facilities as readily available have had higher mortality rates. And I think that's something Qatar has really led the world on. Okay. Uh, that's good to know, and um, I'm, I'm guessing also the hospital care was quite uh, good with the treatments as well, uh, for, even for the people who have had uh, complications. Uh, this is the last question, and I have one more question for myself at the end. Uh, the question is particularly, someone is particularly interested in how many of the reactive over CT of 30 results turn out to be patients who are early infection with lower CT on requested on follow-up samples. Versus recovered patients who still have detectable RNA but are probably not infectious. Um, the majority, I mean, the way we've looked at this, the majority of patients have uh, low C, high CT values who are ASIN and who are being done, for example, as part of a surveillance program. Um, we essentially accept them as patients who've, who've had a recovered infection. Where we see a high CT value fall, and we do see this, is we see it when we're looking at somebody who's had a contact. A specific contact with a known case, or if we're examining uh, an outbreak situation. And to be honest, in an outbreak situation, you can almost predict when the patient is going to develop the virus if they haven't already got it, or if they've got a high CT value, when they're going to develop a low CT value. So we do see this in the context of a contact or in the context of an outbreak. And we specifically have interpretive comments that advise people they need to retest in that situation. I take appropriate infection control measures. Yeah. Uh, so probably have a couple of minutes left. I'll ask one of the questions I had. Uh, so you, you know the model you showed with primary infection, the peak or the type of antibody is generally low, which is what you expect really, and it's really on the second challenge, just like you do with the vaccination. If they are exposed again, you'll see a higher secondary antibody response. Have you seen this in the serology or have you done, uh, designed this? I know you've mentioned pilots, but maybe in some of the data that you could have measured the, uh, you know, the, the primary antibody response after shortly after RT-PCR and maybe they come back, you ask them again to, um, in, in a month or two, to see how many of the population has actually showed any secondary infection. It's a big study, I know, but have you seen anything along these lines? Um, we, we, we've got a large cohort um, of uh, confirmed infections and a large cohort coming from uh, the relevant study. And <clears throat> part of the aim was to cross it and uh, to see whether that, that was happening, whether we were up patients who were being reinfected. I mean, I have looked uh, for reinfections rather than for antibody levels. We have indirect evidence 
of that in that the, the antibody levels in the seroprevalence study are really much higher than we would expect. And we're assuming partially due to the exposure, but we haven't, um, we haven't specifically looked at that. I think there's another study going on that is specifically following patients and retesting them. And I think those okay. studies should be able to okay. show, show, uh, shine light on that phenomenon. But I'm, I'm absolutely certain that it is happening. Yeah, hopefully it is. Yeah, so you don't have to uh, be locked out for too long. Um, the last question I have is regarding the quarantine. Clearly, with the uh, you know calling patients reactive and releasing them because uh, you know it's mainly a virus shedding, not really active virus coming uh, in the uh, RT PCR. Uh, does that also apply for people coming back from overseas? You know, the quarantine seven days versus ten days. I mean, different countries have different quarantine days. Uh, the model seen in Qatar, maybe, the, the, you know, it might not apply to people who are coming from overseas with an infection with the quarantine time. Do you see a problem in this, or is, uh, is this uh, just become just a uh, common knowledge now that there is no infection after, you know, 10 days of quarantine or seven days of quarantine? The, um, I think most people have gone. Remember, we had two, the initial criteria for non infectivity was uh, two negatives, bars apart. But that really was very, very problematic because patients shared virus for so long. Um, increasingly, the evidence has confirmed that probably beyond day yet for normal infection, not for people who are critically ill. And uh, so most people have gone to a time based from presentation and a time based from um, first PCR. And uh, I think what going into the next phase, there is very useful information coming from PCR. There's very useful information coming from quantification of the PCR. There's very useful information coming from antibody responses. And also, increasingly, we've also validated rapid antigen tests that you can do in 10 minutes that essentially detect uh, infectious patients. So I think we need a combination that initially the combination was RT PCR. I think the combinations that we need now. Or PCR antigens and antibody. And so I think if somebody came through who was antibody positive, I think the idea of putting them in the quarantine is very questionable. I don't think it makes any sense. And uh, but if the if they're antibody negative, the next question that you want to ask is are they infectious now? Which an antigen test could do. So I think there's a whole mixture of things. And coming up coming into the winter with the schools reopening. And with, with society going back to normal, you know, there are challenges that we need to use every trick that we have. And I think we have three tricks now. One is PCR, one is antigens, and one is antibody. Yeah. And it'll be much trickier with uh, common flus coming back, right? So it's, we're hitting winter. So people will show symptoms and, uh, you know, suddenly everyone's scared it's corona. It might not be. Well, my and, experience uh, yeah, of winters is. is that if you get viruses one on top of the other at the same time, your hospital will Philip, and remember this year we're going to have two flu viruses, we're going to have two flu B viruses, we're going to have two RSV viruses, and we're going to have COVID. That's seven epidemic viruses potentially. Um, in fact, they will be spreading, but there's no, there's no way of that. The question is if they spread one on top of the other. So, so this winter, I think we really need to have, we need to be set. It's going to be different from the first six months of this year. And um, virus for whatever reason, do transmit. I know it's hard to believe Qatar has a winter, you know, but the viruses behave as if there is a winter. And we yeah. do get epidemics exactly the same way as every other country. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I think we need to be really on our toes this yeah. week, over the next six months. Yeah, it seems that it's a virus holiday. They cannot miss it. They must travel. Uh, so there's one last question uh, about the virus and the, the CT values, that the swap samples are transferred to the labs with the virus transfer media. And the question is, you know, how does this affect interpreting the CT value versus the virus being, in, you know, infectious or the sample has infectious virus or not? So, and I, i.e., the, the virus transfer media could inactivate the virus, and that's why you're not seeing anything in the culture, in the live cell culture. Um, if you're um, if you're trying to culture the virus to use uh, a viral transport medium, and there is a dilutional factor there, but the transport medium is designed to try to isolate the virus. It's designed to protect the virus. It's got antibiotics, it's got buffers, it's got, uh, you know, so, so it's there to allow the virus to survive. Obviously, you need to take precautions. You need to have a sample taken and put on ice, and you can't just leave it around, you know, for three days and then hope you're going to get something out. So the, the most difficult thing, 
And I would say for most of the studies that probably they're not being done optimally. Optimally, you would take a sample from a patient and you would have it in the viral culture within, within an hour or two. That would be the ideal. Most of these are taken probably from samples that have been come in, that have been put into a, a, a minus 80 freezer, that have been thawed. So there is a wee bit of viral loss, definitely, I would imagine. But most of the studies from different countries are all coming down around the same eight to nine days as a cutoff. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I don't think we have any more questions, and I don't have any more questions either. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peter, for the time. It was a really informative presentation and uh, a lot of food for thought, actually. And um, hopefully, the new studies done at the HMC will enable to answer the question about reinfection definitively with immunity as well. I'm looking forward for the uh, vaccine. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you all for attending. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. Bye bye.